welcome at 9 a.m. plus a certain amount um, today for our first full day of the Popper Symposium, the Symposium on Karl Popper and the Open Society. Today, our proceedings have an additional resonance because this was indeed the day 20 years ago that Karl Popper died and um, we, we, are, we are here at least in part to remember him and to mark that occasion. But we're also here to celebrate and to apply the philosophy and to challenge the philosophy that he had spent his life, 60 years of his life, developing. Um, so I'm delighted to have this opportunity to meet with everyone here. There are a few people who will come in, no doubt, after a rather late night um, and uh, you know, whiskey and what have you. They'll, they'll roll in a little later than, than had been anticipated. But um, what, what I anticipate is that this morning, we will have three hours devoted to a groundbreaking book. I think it is a, a book that, that, that truly opens a new area for discussion between two elements within the Popperian community. There are, there are those Popperians who have long sought to interpret Popper through the lens of Hayek and perhaps more broadly through the lens of the Austrian School of Economics, and there are those who recognize that while Hayek and Popper have contributed greatly to each other's understanding and, and modified each other's positions over the years of their friendship, of, over the years of their intellectual collaboration, there was always, despite that collaboration, despite that close friendship from 1935 when they first met at the London School of Economics through to Hayek's death in 1992, there was always some elements of dispute between them. And I think Mark's book, Mark's forthcoming book, which will be published, if I can give the plug, published by Routledge on November, in November 2014, um, with, with a mortgage plan, because uh, it, it, the, as he points out, this is a remarkable price that they wish to charge. But clearly, here, here we have the fulfillment of the Austrian proposal. If there's, if there's a test for this, the quality and, 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 and the uh, desire of the, the consumer of the book will, will indeed support that price. Um, if not, we'll get some interesting information back. So it's all to the good. Uh, Mark, Mark will um, present his work, and we are dividing this morning session into three distinct phases. That was done deliberately. First, because it provides a way of moving from one aspect of the discussion to the other, with me acting as a um, minimally disciplinarian type of timekeeper and chair of the proceedings. The other is that I want undergraduate students to have access to this meeting and to be able to come and go as they please and to therefore give them some indication of what they will be hearing and discussing when they are able to come and sit in on this meeting. So often academic conferences or symposia happen either at the weekend when students, at least in this campus, are not around in great numbers, or they happen outside of the semester in a conference where no undergraduate student manages to attend. Here, I wanted a, an academic event, and this morning, in particular, I want, want an academic event that would generate some controversy, some disagreement among scholars, and for that to occur in front of my students noses. Uh, I mean, you can't get them for, uh, closer to the students' noses than having a section of the dining hall devoted to this particular event. I mean, they, 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 have, to, they have to eat, and they, uh, they have to, uh, at some point or other, encounter this meeting. So I, I, am, I hope we'll have uh, more undergraduate students here, and if not, we've made the opportunity available to them, and we will certainly engage in some quite extensive academic discourse. So, so Mark, I'm going to ask to come up to the podium and to lead. Initially, I think you're presenting a, a tiny synopsis of maybe five minutes or thereabouts, and then we will throw open the entire balance of the session for each of the one-hour segments to the audience, to, to, the, uh, to, to, to wider questions and discussion. The first section will be on rationality, 
and that will take us up to about 10 o'clock. The uh, discussion of rationality includes the question of whether rational intervention by government is a possibility, and, and clearly Hayek doubted that it was. Um, uh, the, the, the second segment, beginning at 10 o'clock, will be on the term economism, um, a term partly of um, Hayek's coinage, but also of, um, of Popper's. Popper certainly came to adopt the concept of economism, as you may have seen in The Open Society and Its Enemies, where he criticizes Marx for a certain type of economism, and also, I believe, in The Poverty of Historicism. So there are references to, Marx, sorry, to, to economism in Popper's writings in that wartime period, uh, or, or, in, in particular in those works. So that will be the, the focus of our second hour this morning, considering economism and the proper methods of social science that attach to that. And then the third session, beginning at 11, going right up to 12, will be considering the differences between Hayek and Popper on democracy. Their different understandings of the term democracy, and their different understandings of the relationship between democracy and open society. Closely related to that is Hayek's and Popper's differences on the question of the rule of law which, um, well, we'll get into precisely how they, they looked at that a little later on. May I also announce one other thing? Two other things. First, if you feel thirsty or hungry at any stage, help yourself bring it back into the room. It's all part of your registration that you have unlimited free access to the, it sounds like a, um, a recipe for, for socialism, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> unlimited free access to, to, to the, the, uh, the springs of abundance that, that uh, have occurred af after the collapse of capitalism. Um, so so we, we have all of the drinks, all of the uh, food stations are available to you. And if you want to have multiple meals, feel free to do so. Bring them in here. Feel free to eat in here. This is a dining room, after all, and continue the conversation. <laughs> um, the other announcement I should make is that they will be testing the campus emergency system at 11 o'clock, uh, but they have promise me that the alarms here will be deactivated. You may therefore, and, and the pulsing lights that go with that. So, the, 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 um, so if you hear it elsewhere, or if you're outside of this room, <laughs> don't panic. It's just a test, we assume. Um, OK? So with that, I am going to hand over to Mark. Natona, did you want to? Is that water? That is water. There's water over here. So, um, but there's also. Oh, uh, we will have half an hour, at least. As Mark um, pointed out to me several, several times on the phone, Mark uh, noted that the schedule was so tightly packed there didn't seem to be any breaks. There is, in fact, a 20... Now, there was originally an hour break for lunch, but uh, it's now reduced to 25 minutes because we've added one more presenter, and she can't stay beyond 2.30. So we're, we're putting her in at, at uh, 12.30, and this is a uh, contact of Mark's from Lehigh University, Denisa Denova, uh, I, I believe it's Duvenova. Duvenova. Um, she will present at 12.30. This is a new edition. Um, and then there will be a round table uh, bringing in a number of people in Eastern Europe and Russia, as well as uh, Denisa and Mark here in Anvil participating in that. If the gods of Apple permit, Apple is releasing its biggest software update at some point today. And when it does, every student on this campus is going to be taking out their iPhones, their iPads, and whatever else, and frantically trying to upload it before anybody else uploads it. And the last time anything like that happened with Apple, the World Wide Web <laughs> disintegrated. It collapsed. It, <laughs> it malfunctioned. So it's possible that our WebEx session will be uh, regrettably interfered with by that. However, let's not contemplate that. Let's, let's look at a pro problem-solving approach. And I'm going to hand over to Mark if this is an appropriate moment for you to start. Have everybody, has everybody been notified of, of the WebEx? Great. Hopefully some will join us. And uh, I know Larry Boland in, um, uh, wanted to join us from Vancouver. So I would hope that he would be there. OK. Now, you need to be mic'd, uh, don't forget. We do have some handhelds, don't we, Kelly? 
Would you, well, but for the recording purposes and WebEx. WebEx will not pick up uh, voices. This, that we have a handheld wireless mic. And uh, do we need to disable the, the podium mic for that to occur? Okay. I'm going to sit over here and join Jack. Is it on? Oh, it's now on. Now you can hear it. I, um, I was hoping um, when Philip told me about the, uh, the symposium and asked me to participate, I was hoping that we would get a, um, a, a huge round table or a huge rectangular table of some sort because um, I have for a long time um, been facilitating discussions like that uh, uh, in, my, in my present uh, role as a fellow of the Interactivity Foundation for the past 14 years and before that when I was working for George Soros in, um, in uh, Eastern Central Europe, um, I introduced uh, the, the idea of the round table format there. And so I was very serious when I said I don't really intend to present material, uh, hopefully to engage you in discussion. And I'm glad to see that there's a small enough group that we can actually get closer and, 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 and and do discuss uh, in that way. Denisa, by the way, Denisa Duvanova, is um, uh, from Kazakhstan, and I met her maybe about 20 years ago in Kazakhstan when she was um, uh, studying political science and very interested in Popper. Um, I should say a, a couple of words about um, this particular chapter on rationale because, uh, rationality, because what it does, of course, is it tries to explore some of the differences between Popper and Hayek about rationality. And uh, uh, if you've read the, um, the, the chapter, you know that it begins with um, uh, pointing out that um, Hayek had actually written to Popper, um, turning down the invitation, regretfully turning down the invitation from, from, from Schilp to contribute to uh, the Library of Living Philosophers volume because, as he said, he didn't feel competent about the topic. The topic that gave him uh, was Popper's rationalism. And this is something um, that I found that they disagreed about. And um, by reading their correspondence, um, as, as some of you know, I have a fortunate to have a uh, microfilm copy of the Pop Popper archives. Um, at my home, so I can uh, go in and check things immediately as I had to do yesterday morning before leaving my home, um, j just to make sure as to you know what you know how how whether I had something right. But um, you know I came across the Popper Hayek correspondence and I was fascinated by it. I say that because somebody, why do you talk about rationality? Why do you begin here? Um, well, you know, I've written about rationality in, in, in other books. Uh, my objectivity, rationality in the third realm is, is, is one of them. Um, Science and the Open Society, I'm Popper. I've, but this is a different discussion about rationality because it really um, focuses upon the differences that Popper and uh, Hayek had. And I begin there because that's where they began, at least in the correspondence that, that, that I have accessible to me. And it was a correspondence that began very early and um, you know, with, with Popper pointing out that uh, there are some things that he could not follow Hayek on all the way. They, d they agreed upon a lot of things, he said, um, and they were trying to agree <laughs> with each other, and that was very evident from the correspondence. They wanted to agree with each other, but it kept coming back over and over again, and there's a number of different aspects to the problem of rationality. Um, the idea of scientism, there are different approaches to scientificism that went into their different understandings of um, scientific method and particularly whether or not there is a unity of scientific method. As you know from last night when George Soros was saying that he was, um, uh, uh, of course he has disagreed with me about the unity of scientific method, but um, the point is, is that his understanding was far closer to Hayek's uh, in my estimation than, than it was to Popper's. So um, there are a number of different uh, aspects to this problem, uh, and I eventually get into talking about what their different arguments against socialism look like. So there's, um, there's scientism, there's unity of method, there's piecemeal engineering, 
Um, there's, there's trying to rationalize the irrational and what rational arguments for socialism look like. And I'm hoping now that you have, <laughs> that's about five minutes, Philip. I'm hoping now that you have actually digested some of that because I know some of you have because you've been poking at me during the past uh, day. But uh, let me then just turn it to you with questions or comments or your, you know, your statements about where I'm wrong. Yeah, there's one. Instead of passing this, there's one right behind you. Yep, over by the standing one. Why, good morning, everybody. Okay. Thank you, um, Chairman and the Turner, Professor Turner. I read your book, very careful written, but uh, I have never before got some information about uh, Hayek as a philosopher. But uh, there is careful analysis between Hayek and Popper comparisons. It is so interesting, as I understand. But uh, I have a few questions on rationality, especially Popper's side, Popper's view, because my uh, especially <coughs> focused on Popper's readings, based and my topic and subject. Uh, as you describe the rationality in Popperian sense, to accept our task, rationalize the irrational. If we accept this argument, why you don't call why you don't call this scientism? Yeah. I think a uh, very important uh, case because uh, in one sense the irrationality all side of rational. Right. How to we divide rational and irrational? Right. I think uh, Popper also accepts we can't sharp distinction between rational and irrational. But irrational sometimes, some days, turns to rational. Yeah. And what is rational? turns to irrational, yeah. especially in scientific field. This is the main problem, I think. Uh, the other question is about uh, Popper's unity of scientific method, as you described in your book copy, uh, scientific method for both natural and uh, social science. I think uh, this approach includes positivist outlook. Positivist outlook approach. Okay. Mm -hmm. Even Popper himself criticized mm -hmm. the logical positivist and logical empirist he still includes some positivist uh, elements in inheritance in his view, if I understand right. I think uh, his view something idealized opinion, especially uh, to describe scientific method because trial and error is an epistemic 
principal, method, or empirical? How can we describe yeah. this one? Let, 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 me, let me try to um, get at these, no, and, and, and by I, the way. I, I, I'll finish. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. If, uh, as we know, there is no completely falsification and verification. Okay, thank you. And, and, and as I do, I, I, I do want it to be a, a discussion. So feel free to, um, John, you can feel free to answer these questions. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, I think you're getting at really the heart of what I'm trying to explain. Uh, of course, this notion of rationalizing the irrational is um, the task of science. And Popper, part of what I try to explain, what Popper tries to explain in some of the letters that I quote in that, from, in that first chapter, that was where they began. They began with this discussion about scientism. And Popper um, confesses, as he puts it, that he still has some sympathies with scientism. And as the letters unfold, what you come to recognize um, is that they have very different ideas about what scientific method is, um, let alone what the methods of the natural and social sciences are. Um, and as that begins to... Um, as that begins to unfold, uh, you, you see that Popper's views also, while they sound scientistic in the way in which the positivist views did, like he wants to rationalize the irrational, and he also believes that there's a unity of method, his concept of what scientific method was, was entirely different from what the positivists thought. So, you know, I, I came across this in, 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 in my first book on um, objectivity, rationality in the third realm. It was the same type of thing. So I, in, in some way, I was alerted to this before I, I began writing. Um, you know, Gottlob Frege, who was um, one of the, uh, well, Carnap regarded him as a, a kind of godfather for the positivist movement. Um, except that he wanted to introduce a third realm of eternal thoughts to provide for the objectivity of rational knowledge. So does Popper. Now, Frege meant the certainty of scientific knowledge. Popper's a fallibilist. And I, at the time, was writing the, my doctoral thesis with the thesis that this is what anti-psychologism was about to provide the certainty for scientific knowledge, and hence, there was a big contradiction in logical positivism, namely, um, the adherence to empiricism, and um, uh, the adherence to empiricism and anti-psychologism. Anti-psychologism and empiricism contradict each other. So Popper says the same thing, but he means something entirely different because his theory of knowledge is entirely different. Empiricism and anti-psychologism contradict each other if the method of science is to justify its theories. So this is the, fir you know, this is the first thing, the scientism. It, it, those letters open up with Popper vacillating back and forth, wanting to agree with Hayek entirely, but unable to, and, and struggling in his, in his own mind. And coming out and saying, quite frankly, I have to tell you where I, I don't follow you. And the crux to that matter becomes, what do you mean by scientific method? Because that's what scientism was for Hayek. Hayek thought of scientism as the attempt upon the part of the social scientists to, as he put it, ape um, the methods of the natural sciences, trying to get, uh, as it were, um, trying to claim the cognitive authority of science by following the scientific method. And it was a perfectly, probably a perfectly natural idea um, in the beginning of the century. 
um, it, it's, it's ironic. Um, you know, you had the great success of Newtonian mechanics. And, um, you know, the philosophers in those days distinguished between matters of fact, relations of ideas, or analytic and synthetic truths, but mathematics, geometry, Kant thought was a priori synthetic. He thought that Newtonian mechanics was a priori synthetic, which meant, in a word, it was strictly universal and certain. And that blows up. And, and But people said, well, how did they do that? How did they get that? And they, they said, the scientific method. So social sciences, which in the late, you know, in the 19th century, it was moral philosophy. They began to say, well, we want to do, we want to be that good too. And so how do we become that good too? We follow the scientific method, as they understood it, as it was described for them, which was essentially inductivism. You make careful observations, you generalize your theories, so on and so forth. Now, that's what Hayek understood by the scientific method. And then the social scientists were trying to do that too. So if you think about, you know, like, say something like behaviorism is a great example. I mean, trying to, you know, make careful observations, we will not admit anything that we can't observe. Well, that's not what Popper understood by scientific method. And by this time, Popper, of course, had written his uh, Logic to Forschung. And his idea of scientific method, ironically, was what Hayek thought the social sciences were, should be about. They shouldn't be about careful observation, and they shouldn't be about um, uh, inductive generalization. They should be a priori, more a priori speculative in nature. That's what Popper thought all science was. This, this by the way, uh, you know, when, when George was talking last night, that's how he understands it. He understands Popper's um, scientific method for natural science well, he understands natural science more like the positivist idea. And so that's why he, th that's why he thinks that there is a, uh, the, the unity of method thesis that Popper argues for is mistaken. We've argued about this for 20 years, um, <laughs> but, but it's still there. So I think that this is the, you know, this, this is, this is the, then enters into this whole discussion about the unity of method. If you notice the, the, this, the passages that I quote, Popper is very careful to say, of course, I believe in the unity of method, but not in the way in which other people have thought, where the unity of method then was, we're going to begin with empiricism and work it way all the way up from, say, physics, you know, all the way up to uh, so, you know, sociology or what, whatever is going to be in the penthouse of that firm castle of science. And that was never Popper's idea of scientific method. Popper's idea of scientific method was, first of all, you begin with a problem. And then you have a, a tentative solution to how to pro, uh, solve the problem. And, and then you try to uh, find it, you know, you test your solution, see if there's any errors in that. So it's a completely different idea. You don't begin with observation. You know, as he used to say, uh, somebody, you say, you know, if you say to your students, observe. Observe. Observe what? You know, what do you want me to observe? And of course, as soon as you tell them what you want them to observe, then you have selection bias and confirmation bias and all the other biases that go along with it. So it's a completely different idea of method um, that, 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 that uh, informs that debate. And in some ways, I think it's the way it progresses, it seems to me that it's almost like my discussions with, um, with Soros, because um, when we talk about these things, and it seems to me that this is what happened between Popper and Hayek, they wanted to agree a lot. And, um, and they would make concessions. Maybe Hayek more than Popper, but, but, but they would make concessions. But somehow it was always underlying the same theme. And as I, I, I say at some point in the chapter, you know, when you have two people I guess I'm talking about piecemeal engineering at that point, where you have two people, they're arguing about piecemeal engineering. And, and um, you know, Popper at one point says, um, if I could take back the term, I would, but, but of course, he, I mean, he keeps to it, and he defends the use of the term, piecemeal engineering. And Hayek doesn't like the term, though he seems to recognize that something 
that he's doing is kind of coming into, well, when two people are arguing for so long about a word, and one, you know, one of them says words don't matter, right? Um, they're arguing so long about words, whether or not you know, we should call it piecemeal engineering, and they kind of seem to agree with each other, but one doesn't want to use the word and the other refuses to get it. There's something more than just the word that's involved. And my own sense is that what's more than just the word that's involved is the whole approach to philosophy, um, which, which goes into the rationalism question because for Popper, rationality was speculative, problem, tentative theory, try to eliminate the errors. Um, you don't care too much about words. Okay, we, ha we have to communicate. Can't define our terms. It's silly to think that we can define them once and for all. That was Popper's position. There's no essence. Um, Hayek, on the other hand, talks about the original meanings of words and seems to try to derive substantive philosophical theories or theses from the meanings of words. And so it's more like a positivist uh, approach where there are true analytic statements and it's the role of the philosopher to tell you what they are, meanings of words. Um, and I think that this is really part of what's at issue. If you think about the arguments that they actually gave against socialism, Hayek's were often derived from the meanings of terms. Um, Popper's were derived from his experience. I should let somebody else well, we, we have uh, two, two three you. more okay, people. Thank you. Th thank you. Just enter into can, it. Can I, can I pass the mic now to uh, Jack Berner? And then I saw Jeremy Shermer and then Bill Berkman after that. So uh, we have, that will probably take us up to 10 o'clock. And, and Rod Thomas is, uh, Rod, Rod Thomas was made and Sebastian Bautic. Yes, uh, Sebastian's from, from uh, Romania. Rod is from uh, supposedly part of England, but really <laughs> the, the, bit, the bit of England that's part of the Scottish border. Maybe they'll take that part with them. Jack. Sorry, Rod. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, first of all, I, not only would I like to thank Phil for uh, inviting me, but actually discovering that somebody was dealing with the differences between Hayek and Popper came as a relief to me, because I've been, uh, I've been working on that. And I must confess that I didn't know Mark was working on it too. So I didn't refer in my publications to, I don't know if you have already published about, about this argument, but, uh, since your book hasn't appeared yet, I, I don't you, refer you, to you, it. You don't and have I think to apologize because I don't refer to anybody. So. Oh, okay, that seems fair to me. <laughs> now, um, when Mark and I uh, chatted uh, last night over dinner, uh, it must be our Popperian background, but we agreed to disagree because a conference where people agree on everything is extremely boring. So um, I've been looking at Mark's material, but damn it, I couldn't find anything to disagree with. So in my despair, uh, first, first of all, uh, my, my, my first reaction would be uh, to, to think of Oscar Wilde who said, well, if I find somebody agreeing with me, I know I must be wrong. But <laughs> then perhaps for the reasons of, of, of the investment of time in the argument, I, I don't want to follow that. Road. Now, in my despair of thinking how to enliven this symposium, um, I resort to a so sort of um, second sort of plan B, sort of second plan, uh, in order to uh, uh, try to uh, provoke Mark into reacting. Um, and it's a bit of an unfair sort of comment because I'm going to talk about the things that you don't say in your book. Now, we all know that's, that's slightly unfair because I know an, a great amount of work has been put into it. You are part of the uh, growing tribe of people who uh, are doing archive work. And you can only do that non-inductively. But for Popperians, that, that's, of course, that's a, almost a tautology. But you start doing archive work because there's something that you have encountered in the published work that doesn't seem right. And well, you know, 
Yes. No. <laughs> Actually, what happened with me was um, when Bill Bartley died, um, Carl asked me if I would edit his works from the archives. So I started doing archive works because he said that was my job now. <laughs> he sent me his, um, he sent me his, um, his archives on microfilm, which I, which I still have in my possession. Um, but I mean, it, it wasn't because I was looking for something, I was looking for books to publish. And um, we, uh, we published uh, Myth of the Framework and um, Knowledge in the Body-Mind Problem. I mean, we worked on those while Carl was still alive. And then, of course, an obvious thing, correspondence. So I was looking, I was thinking about Popper and the Popperians, um, you know, and then Popper and Hayek. But um, so it, it, it's really quite funny. It, it actually is funny um, because, you know, you have everybody's letters. And so I can, there's a philosopher that I knew in Chicago who uh, used to tell this story that he took a course from Popper and, um, and uh, Popper, um, uh, he, he, he had been told, he knew from everybody that you just told him exactly what he wanted to hear and he would give you an A. And uh, so he wrote his paper saying exactly what he wanted to hear. Well, I have his grade sheets. <laughs> so, so I know the grades have, so I said that to him. Well, you know, I have his archives and his grade sheets. I think that was the last time he told that story. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, at least there, there's, a, there's a, a slight point of difference between the two of us because I started doing archive work on Popper and High because um, I was convinced that the two gentlemen who were always extremely nice to each other in their publications and pretended they agreed on everything, they, they couldn't possibly agree on very important points. And as a matter of fact, in partly the same correspondence from New Zealand between Popper and Hayek, um, I started to see where they disagreed. And I also have um, some ideas about where these differences come from. And now that is what I'm going to briefly talk about because that you don't go into yeah. in, in your book. Now, first of all, um, Uncharacteristically, because Popper was not always uh, uh, very nice to people who disagreed with him, um, he went out of his way to paper over the differences with Hayek. And, well, I have an idea why he did so. Because repeatedly, apart from his great admiration, Popper's great admiration for Hayek, he writes things like, you are so brilliant and I can't pretend to, 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 to rise to your level or something like that. But he also was extremely grateful personally because uh, he said that Hayek saved his intellectual life by, uh, pro first of all, by uh, making it possible that Popper left Austria and find a job somewhere else. And then in New Zealand, where Popper was extremely isolated and un unhappy, Hayek also uh, managed to create the chair uh, in the philosophy of science, uh, logic and philosophy of science, uh, for Popper at the LSE. Now, uncharacteristically, uh, Popper was so grateful that he was even willing to not to stress his criticism of Hayek, which, as you can see from correspondence, and if you read largely between the lines of their publications, does exist. Now, that makes me come to my second. There's also a sort of asymmetry be between Popper and Hayek. Um, I've seen a letter. They, they got together, uh, among other things, after the war at the Albach Forum, which is something which is held in Austria, in a little village, uh, originally uh, on, at the initiative of an Austrian student who had been an anti-fascist uh, 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 to save Western liberal democracy. Yeah. And there's a letter uh, in German uh, from Popper to Hayek where he says, um, and I'm grateful to you that I may now call you Fritz. So by first, now, which in the German culture is an important step in the evolution of friendship. So apparently before, uh, of course they correspond in English where there's no difference, but when they corresponded in, in, in German or when uh, Popper thought in German about Hayek, he thought in terms of the Z of the polite uh, form of address. And so 
that shows a sort of asymmetry in the relationship between the two, uh, the two men. Now, I also have an idea about where their profound differences come from, and they are really profound in, in, in two, two uh, meanings of the word. They're profound theoretically and philosophically, but they're also profound between uh, quotation marks in terms of time, because their differences go right back to their very first intellectual interests. Hayek, when he came back from the First World War, where, among other things, he had been a medical soldier, um, was very interested in the functioning of the human brain. Now, when the University of Vienna closed for lack of firewood or something like that, he went to uh, Zurich for some, somewhere between four and six weeks, where he dedicated himself. He, he, he went to a brain anatomy laboratory, so he dissected the human brain, and he started reading up on the latest results in, uh, in psychology and, and, and the theory of mind. And he also came across uh, Schlick's uh, 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 General Theory of Knowledge, the first edition, which had a profound influence on Hayek because it put him on the track of trying to explain uh, the human mind completely in with the help of the laws of physics. And that marks a profound difference with Popper, who right from the beginning from his career, he, Popper was interested in, in, in psychology, he worked in psychology, and he had very different ideas, which he later worked out into his interactive uh, dualism. And I am convinced that all the differences, all, no exception, <laughs> all the differences between Popper and Hayek go right back to their different theories of the human mind. Hayek, who has a physicalist uh, 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 theory of the mind, and Popper, who doesn't believe in physicalism. And Popper, actually, when the sensory order, Hayek's book that uh, this, this, this 1920 manuscript was turned into in the early 1950s, Hayek sent a copy of the sensory order to Popper, and Popper hated the book because it was far too inductivistic yes. for his taste. And Hayek was, was very disappointed by that. that. I've seen a letter from the 1970s in which he writes to Popper, and I hope that one day you will come to like my sensory <laughs> order. And so I'm convinced and I have arguments that show that all the differences go right back to not only the different theories of, the, of, of mind, but also to different epistemologies. Well, I, mean, this, I mean, this is the fundamental thing. I mean, this is fundamentally Popper's theory of knowledge. I, you know, like it, people say, well, a whiff of inductivism. That is the whole thing. I mean, his critique of induction and the critique of justificationism, it's the critique of empiricism. It's the critique of the idea that um, metaphysics has no place. Everything goes back to that. I think that, the, I think that that's really fundamental. Metaphysics has no place. No, no, I mean the positivists. Uh -huh. ah. yes. So Popper was, yes. I mean, from the very beginning, Popper was trying to salvage metaphysics and from that positivist attack. Now, the positivist attack, what you're talking about is that's the big difference, the induction, the empiricism, the radical empiricism, the you know, words, um, uh, words have uh, precise meanings, analytic truths, all of that. Popper is opposed to that whole constellation of ideas. And it seems to me that's the reason why he uh, was found himself so much at odds with the philosophical, the other philosophers in the world at the time. I wanted to make one, oh, I'm sorry, let me make one more comment, Jeremy. Jeremy. Um, I do think that there is something to the idea that um, both Popper and Hayek felt this moral duty to fight against um, such things as um, communism, totalitarianism, authoritarian, and I guess my sense is that there might be something to the idea of let's not attack each other on our disagreements. Yes. It's more important to emphasize, present a united front. Exactly. And, um, and 
that was one of the things that I was thinking about when I began writing this book, um, the idea that, um, well, time has passed now. Maybe let's look at some of the differences. Okay, can, can I bring in Jeremy? We, we are close, you know, we're 10 minutes away from the end of this segment, and uh, I'd like to get to Jeremy and then Bill we move on to the next. Okay, I'll come in fairly speedily and bluntly. I think in the, the, there was a big problem about your first chapter, which is that you were unpoparian, and you were unpoparian in the sense that you didn't really look to see what Hayek's problem situation was that his work was addressing. Uh, while I don't disagree with what Jack was saying about the interest of their differences in psychology, it seems to me that a key issue in Hayek's development was um, when he returned after his brief visit to America, to Vienna, he joined Ludwig von Mises' seminar. And as a consequence of uh, his time in that context, he came to really a very important conclusion, which is put in ways that aren't always very really easy to understand, but which I think can probably best in this context be summed up in the following way. That there are various structural factors in the working of a market-based society which pose, if we want those things to continue, constraints on what we can do and how we can address problems. That this, in his view, was illuminated by the sort of economics that uh, he had been brought up in and got to know then uh, in the uh, Mises circle, and that this, in a sense, was under threat both by various claims about uh, how we should approach issues in tackling social problems, including, if it had actually been spelled out, some aspects of poppers, because he really didn't, I think, accept that there were these kinds of constraints, but also uh, various methodological views which were held on the one side by the institutionalists and the remnants of the later German historical school, uh, which he was criticizing in, in the uh, uh, work that you're dealing with, but also which he saw as being challenged by the physicalist aspects of positivism. And essentially, it was against this that his work was directed. And so in some respects, he and Popper are talking at cross purposes. Popper, though, and if I can here uh, throw something in the direction of our chair as well, I mean, Hayek is in some ways an interventionist. He was criticized by Mises and he was criticized by Ayn Rand exactly for this. But Hayek's view was, if you want government to do things, you need to get government to operate in ways that won't stuff up the working of crucial social mechanisms. And if I were to sum up what was at issue between Popper and Hayek on this score, it was basically that Popper was blind to the idea that there could be such constraints. And in the sort of anti-essentialism that he held when he was writing The Open Society, he came pretty close to denying that there could be any such thing. And in that particular respect, in terms of anti-essentialism, the other bit's all right, but in that particular respect, Popper is wrong. He uh, actually went uh, back on this in his own uh, philosophy of natural science, where he accepted a modified essentialism, and if he'd have only gone back and rewritten the open society, <laughs> then, uh, in fact, he and Hayek could have been on better wavelengths. Do you want to respond, or shall I pass directly on to Bill? Oh, yeah, I'll respond with that. Okay. Yeah, my, my comment actually re relates to Jeremy's, and I agree that von Mises is a huge figure here. He's huge for Hayek uh, and, and formative in Hayek's views. And I do think that Popper was fu fundamentally did not agree with von Mises, did not have the view, did not idealize the the uh, you know the the quote free market in the way that von Mises had, and even as Jeremy said, Hay Hayek was willing to allow the welfare state as sort of alongside this idealized market. Yeah. 
that would that would marvelously do everything well. But and, and I think a lot of their disagreement over interventionism was because Popper never bought into the whole von Mises laissez-faire hands-off thing, which which Hayek was willing, I mean, Hayek explicitly said he doesn't accept laissez-faire, he accepts a welfare state, but the welfare state was doing functions that didn't interfere with the market. Whereas Popper was, I think, willing to have experiments that did inter interfere with the market. But I think, unlike Jeremy, I think Popper was right and Hayek was wrong, which comes to something, I mean, I'm gonna talk about this afternoon, but Hayek was a terrible economist. <laughs> um, von Mises was a terrible economist. They were totally wrong historically. Every society which has developed a, a wealthy society, every single one has had strong government intervention all along. The, von Mises and Hayek's views are just complete, are just complete fantasy. Anyway, uh, I'll talk about that later, but m my wife Isabel in her book, Agricultural Transformation, has documented that every society which went from a poor society to a rich society was led by government intervention, led. So the fact that Hayek here is 100% wrong and von Mises are 100% wrong about the nature of government intervention is actually a key part of this. Naturally, there are other issues on rationalism, you know, nature, the nature of rationality and, and the nature of, of social science and rationality within social science, but on this third leg, so to speak, of your, of your chapter, which deals with interventionism, I think it's really important to realize how big a feature, two things. Number one is how big von Mises is as, as, a, as a figure standing behind Hayek particularly, yeah. but the other is, um, uh, 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 well, I forgot the other one. Anyway, anyway well, no, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll I mean come, to respond to, to both of you, um, first of all, I think that the way I read the letters, um, it wasn't so much Popper saying, oh, you're a proponent of laissez-faire. It's Popper saying, you're going to sound like a proponent of laissez-faire. You're going to sound like an apologist for laissez-faire. And that is, I think, the way he sounds. As a, as a matter of fact, Philip just sent me an uh, article, which uh, was just recently published, about letters between Koch and Charles Koch and, 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 and Hayek that where they talk about Hayek as laissez-faire. Hayek was willing to accept all sorts of intervention. Um, minimum income. He proposed a, min, a minimum. He wanted to keep it out of the marketplace. Is that the key thing? But the thing is, he, I, I think that he, what my, my view is that he didn't see this as being, or he didn't present it as being governmental intervention, which is why Popper writes to him, you, you, you want to make it clear that what the choice is is not between laissez-faire and intervention or intervention and no intervention, it's between two kinds of interventionism. And you got to make, you know, so it's, but when you, I mean, otherwise it, it just sounds like you're saying no intervention whatsoever. And this is unfortunately the way it often does sound. Yes, sir? Can I say something? <clears throat> I don't just sound like an apologist for laissez-faire. I am an apologist for laissez-faire. Um, yeah, a number of points. Um, Hayek, I think, uh, you have to be very careful because Hayek took the view that liberals, libertarians, whatever you want to call them, had always been a minority. And whenever they'd had success, uh, it was by alliance with other groups, which on a historical time scale were temporary. So therefore, in um, the Constitution of Liberty, he puts forward all kinds of measures, which he doesn't really, in his ideal perfect society, w would think were a good thing, like minimum income and things like this, because he's trying to build a broad coalition. Uh, he understands that having a minimal income does interfere with the market and does screw things up, uh, does have terrible consequences. Uh, he understands that a welfare state has terrible consequences. That's why all over the world today people are backing away from uh, welfare states. Um, but he, but he, in, in the Constitution of Liberty, he's not putting forward that this is the sort of society I would love to see. What he's saying is this is my platform for an alliance between all those who can come together 
on a common platform that will not endanger certain basic essentials. Uh, uh, and so therefore, he's prepared to go along with farm subsidies, for God's sake. Um, you know, uh, indefensible things like that he's prepared to go along with because he's always pointing out um, you know, that they're not, they, they can be admitted in a kind of broad liberal coalition or Whiggish uh, coalition, because he's ultimately more of a Whig than a liberal, um, you know, that, that he has a great respect for what has grown uh, naturally. Uh, uh, historically, which is something where I think Popper was right and he was wrong, but he did have that sort of perspective. So I think that's, um, that's what I think is easy to misinterpret Hayek because he's all the time aware of the fact that um, if he comes out in defense of laissez-faire, it's, it's going to, um, uh, he's not gonna, he's gonna lose all possibility of influence. I did wanna say something that, that I <coughs> read in your book where you, you uh, said that, um, <coughs> Hayek said that socialism was impossible. Hayek went to great pains to avoid saying that socialism was impossible. Uh, Ludwig von Mises in 1920 said socialism is impossible. Um, and I think what he meant by that was that if you try to get rid of markets in factors of production, there'll be a drop in output doesn't sound the same as socialism in, is impossible, but I think that's what he was getting at. And I think that Hayek uh, agreed with that. Um, if you read Hayek's three great articles about the economic calculation debate, the two of which appeared in Collectivist Economic Planning in 1935, and the other one which he wrote a bit later about the competi so-called competitive um, solution. In one of those, <laughs> he says, he, he quotes someone as saying uh, over the question of whether socialism is possible, and he, and he says, of course socialism, it, anything is possible, meaning that it can be tried. Well, but, um, the, but that, I don't think that I say that socialism, that he said that socialism. Oh, you do? He, it, I think it, he it, says that, I think he, he argues that it would be impossible for a socialist economy to be as efficient and productive as the market. And not, I think, just, uh, yeah. not just factually. Yeah, mm -hmm. just it, it's logically impossible, and I think he uses the term logically impossible. I mean, I, that's part of the argument that I'm making against. Right, it. always, always understanding that by socialism here is meant a system which completely abolishes markets in factors of production and replaces them with central administrative right. direction. Right? Yeah. So other kinds of socialism, market socialism, so on, would not be covered by this. But that's a t that's a question of the evolution of the term socialism. Um, but um, there is also another um, passage in, in, the, in one of those, in the third uh, article, uh, uh, the competitive solution article, where he says that it's never been claimed that a socialist economy uh, would be impossible. And it's never been claimed, and this, I, th I was quite startled when I read this, it's never been claimed that um, a socialist uh, economy wouldn't be able to continually increase output. Now, I think Mises would have denied that a socialist economy could continually increase output, and I would deny that a, a socialist economy uh, defined in this particular way uh, could, in, could in, uh, continually increase output. Um, so I think that uh, that's a misunderstanding about you know, what Hayek said. Uh, I, think, I, don't, I think he, was, he, he, was, he came to the defense of Mises uh, but he didn't actually have similar methodological views to Mises at all. His views were utterly different on the methodology of economics. Um, and, he had, and of course, the whole uh, element of uh, the, cr the creation of knowledge and so on that Hayek emphasizes is rather alien to Mises. Mises is a neo-Kantian who has this a prioristic approach, well, which, know, what, which what, Hayek it, doesn't have. What, what, I mean, what's interesting with Mises, um, I mean, at least it caught my eye just rather recently. And I'm trying to remember where it's in. I think it's in human action. Is that where it's at? Um, there's, there's a passage, um, because that's how I was reading Mises, um, and, 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 and also Hayek with regard to, to social science coming from Mises, um, neo-Kantian a priorist. Well, you know, in many ways, Popper comes from Kant too. Um, a priori ideas, but he differs with Kant in the idea that just because it's a priori idea, it doesn't mean that it's a priori certain. 
And in this passage that I have in mind in Mises, he, it's a paragraph where he tosses it, it sounds just like Popper. You can be mistaken about the a priori. Now, frankly, I mean, that came after I've written all of this stuff, and I don't talk much about Mises in the book, but that really kind of makes you begin to wonder. Um, it sounded like Mises was far, more, far closer to Popper than I ever thought. Um, The, uh, the idea was that the op he could be mistaken about the a priori. That, that's what he says in the past. The question is, is it, is it because your analysis is incorrect, or can you put the a priori or hypothetical up against empirical data? And I don't think Parmesis ever had that concept, which is possible. Brian, do you, do you re remember it off? Jesus says that uh, you can criticize the, uh, the axiom or criticize the ar argument, and somebody can be wrong. But, that, but, but he's saying, basically, you either criticize the axiom or you criticize the argument. And he, but he also says that people can only approach knowledge they can't know for sure. That's right. So can't know for certain. I think it's on... Because I think it's on page 67, because I think in our discussion I actually looked it up. I think it's on page 67 of Human Action, uh, third edition. But, but the notion was that here you would have a priori knowledge that wouldn't be a priori certain. And he, the way he tosses it off, I mean, I, I say tosses it off, it sounds as if he's saying, oh, well, of course, <laughs> you know, as opposed to, oh, and here's big news. Um, it is big news for um, you know, most people who think in terms of a priori as being apodictically certain, which is the way in which, I mean, I think most people do. If the axiom is true and the, and the axiom is valid, right. the argument is valid, then it's true. And that's basically what he's saying, but you can still criticize the axiom mm -hmm. and you can criticize the argument. But it's not empirical. Well, I mean, if you can criticize it, why can't you I, criticize I don't think, it? No, it's criticism? not empirical. I mean, von Mises is not empirical. He's, he's doing this big axiomatic system. I mean, I'm not an expert on von Mises, but when I've what I've read of him is it's very clear. It's, it's, it's an a priori system. And when he makes the transition to in the real world, he said, well, it's, it's kind of obvious that this works best, which but, me, to but me Bill, is like pathetic. But Bill, anyway. Bill, <laughs> Bill, Popper's theories are a priori too. They're speculative hypotheses. Yeah, they're that speculative we can see. hypotheses, but he he's willing. Then they then they're empirically tested, which is the whole point. Well, that, von Mises never has empirical testing. You should show me where von Mises says that we should take our theories and look at look at how the economy works in detail and see whether it stands up to the to the to the to these axioms and will throw out the axioms if they don't stand up. That's a totally different way of thinking than von Mises. Jeremy and Popper, D in fact, never wanted to talk about von Mises. I think because he it was going to be like explosive with with uh, Hayek. Do, do you have a comment on it, Jeremy? Yeah, let me, uh, Jeremy, unless you want to get up to the mic. Yeah, it, it, if I could. There seem to me to be various different things going on. That's to say. I would actually take it that at the center of the concerns of Mises and then of Hayek were certain kinds of theoretical claims, including, for example, the claims about the problems of economic calculation under socialism, where it was argued that this was a theoretical result and that this wasn't to be obtained inductively. Mises himself then offered a kind of gloss on what he was up to and how this was to be understood, which was uh, drawing on uh, discussions that, he'd uh, that had taken place in the Mises circle uh, of Weber and of Rickert and so on. And he put together in this not particularly effective way a kind of neo-Kantian a priorism. But it seems to me that, I mean, one could certainly talk about that if one wanted to, but I'd have thought that the, the central issue here in some ways isn't so much a priorism as the claim that there were certain 
kinds of claims one could make and defend about the characteristics of different sorts of economic systems, which if they, if they were correct, were really going to be very telling, where the key thing in that context was, in a sense, is the economic reasoning right, rather than matters of empirical testability of those things. And if that sort of knowledge is any good, then that, in fact, imposes if you want to keep those structures in place, certain kind of constraints on what you can do at the same time, such as not engaging in certain types of piecemeal social engineering of the kind that you guys seem to be still very enthusiastic about. One thing that I was thinking about is that um, one criticism that I would level against both Marx and Mises would be that they're both economically deterministic and their idealized versions of visions of the world that view the economic system as independent of the political and social fabric in which it's embedded. And you see this in like the mindset of, uh, as it was mentioned, if you look at the history of markets, they're very clearly a conscious effort on parts of states to build their markets. You have protectionist systems um, for the flow of capital and the, go the gold standard. Uh, Carl Polanyi made a huge, rather arcane argument that this, the gold standard led both to the period of peace from Vienna to the First World War, and then the resulting World War I and World War II as a breakdown of the liberal economic system. But the other aspect is that they have the mindset that certain things are not intervention, but certain things are. Like the idea of having a small government, yet at the same time a government exists a priori to have things like contracts, or currency, or build roads, like these things are kind of ignored. At the same time, that like like it's it, you see they see them they seem to say that that it's not they don't count. Well, it's sort of like it, I, mean, I, I think that that's perfectly right. It's sort of like um, give me my permanent legal framework, and now don't intervene, right? But give me my permanent give me my legal framework, and by the way, make it permanent. I mean, that's a Big giving, you know. At, at, at some place in 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 the book, I I, I in some place you can go ahead. <laughs> at some place in the book, I um I point out, that's the beauty of deduction. I mean, give me my axioms, give me my laws, give me my definitions, and you know I'll give you your conclusions as well. I'm sorry, you want to? No, 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 no. Let, let me let me pass no, the mic to you, Isabel. No, 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 no. I, I've always got something to say. Um, I, I don't think it's a great discovery that classical liberals um, you know, thought that we needed a government, but it should be very limited. Right. Uh, but it was absolutely essential. This right. goes back to Locke and people like right. that. And, and um, uh, I, I don't think it's something they overlooked or that they, was, they were careless about. I mean, I think they, they, it was quite a deliberate theoretical right. choice. Uh, we abs this is the Lockean tradition. Yeah, I mean, we, need, we need a magistrate to keep order. It's very inconvenient if we don't have him yeah. um, or her. Uh, uh, but th th then they should keep their hands off what uh, right. people's private business. That, that, now, that's a perfectly coherent position. I agree. Uh, and uh, I don't think there's some sort of conceptual oversight there. And I, I, I agree. I, don't misunderstand me. What, what, I'm, what I'm saying, though, is that that is an intervention. And that's precisely, I think, what Popper's pointing out as from very early on. This is not like, it's not, but of course, when it comes to Hayek's view of law, laws, I, I was going to say, well, this isn't, as it were, a, a, a law of nature. But of course, when it comes to Hayek, that's what laws are. They're natural laws, actually. Our normative laws are actually natural laws. They're, they're found, not made. That's one of the big disagreements between Popper and, and, and Hayek. Popper thought of laws as being conventions that we make and that we can remake, that we can write and rewrite on the shifting sands of, of human experience. And it's very interesting because um, it marks what I discovered actually in writing the last chapter, which, you know, the real, a, a big difference in their concepts of open society. Because for Popper, the transition from a closed to open society occurs when you first begin to recognize that fact, that the laws that, your normative laws are 
conventions, human conventions that you can rewrite, that you can try to change, that you can work to change. Um, for Hayek, it was more like the transition to open society occurs when you recognize that the same law applies to everyone, equality under the law, which is a good concept, but it's a different concept. And those laws are equality under the laws, which you should, ought not try to change, uh, even though you may discover that you were mistaken about some of them as time goes by. Now, I'm just looking, um, I just want to say, who's taking care of the time here? Well, I guess that's yeah. meant to be me, but I, I was going to roll with the punches or, or but whatever. But we can we continue. I, it, I, I, we probably should be transitioning to the second segment, which is on economism and social measures. But Jeremy methods. wanted to say something, I think. And, and there's, there's also a, you, you haven't had a chance to say anything, so let, let, me, let me give a last I'm Larry Udell, I'm from Westchester University. I just found out about this yesterday afternoon. Uh, so, uh, but uh, uh, I'm very struck by a comment Popper made in an interview that you did with him in the Open Society after 50 years that I think is... Oh, okay. Well, I thought that was you. Are you. Did you edit the book or... All right. I don't know why I have your name associated with it, but uh, in any event, he said uh, that there were uh, three problems, and he was, th this was at the end of his life, he was obviously very frustrated uh, about this, and, and he mentioned uh, that we must have peace, that we must have education, and that we must have full employment, and that surely one of the tasks, and this is where I think there's a big difference between Popper and Hayek that hasn't sort of come onto the table yet, but uh, Popper says, it's one of the tasks of economics to ensure that we have full employment, and we ought to be able to do that. And Hayek thought it was the job of the market without anything else. Uh, so he didn't really think it was the job of economics, uh, that it just happened. Uh, and I think that's a very important point, especially where we're looking now. If you want to defend pure liberalism, uh, how do you account for this mess that happened in 2008 that hasn't corrected itself yet? Uh, and where are we going from there? You know, you know, Popper, there's a letter that he wrote to um, Rudolf Carnap back in 1947 when after the Open Society had come out and, and the road to serfdom was, was, was out too where, you know, there's a series of letters and it's a very interesting uh, series of letters um, for what it shows about, first of all, both Popper and Carnap, um, but maybe also what it shows um, uh, about liberal leaning, socialist leaning. Um, but the background of it was that Popper, you know, he, made no, he makes no bones about it. Uh, he, he regarded himself as a, a communist when he was a teenager. He was long regarded himself as a, a socialist, but came to break with it. Um, due to certain experiences that he had in um, that he had in Vienna, and um, didn't think that um, socialism couldn't work or couldn't be even more efficient and productive than a market, but tended to think it wouldn't because of the attitudes of the people who were trying to you know, operate it. And of course, Carnap and the positivists they were a socialist movement. Um, and, and thought of themselves self-consciously that way. And um, so coming out with this, um, the Open Society and its enemies, uh, through this series of letters, Carnap finally puts it you know, bluntly, well, do you still regard yourself as a, a socialist? And Popper writes um, what I think is really um, a brilliant letter um, that you should, you, you, I mean, you try to get hold of it and read it. Available? I yes, think... Soon after the Open Society. You've, yeah. It's in both of their books. Some of you, the full thing in your book. Yeah. I, I, I quote from it in, I quote from it in, um, in um, I, and I think I, I discussed that, I think I discussed that correspondence in Science in the Open Society. There's a, a, a talk in there called um, Popper's Critique of Scientific Socialism or Carnap and His Co-workers. Uh, and it talks about how they excluded Popper and, and why. Um, but, um, I, and I also, I think, quote from it in, in this second uh, Hayek and Popper book, which isn't out yet. But the, the point is, 
um, that what Popper lays out um, was, um, I mean, he comes down and says, uh, I, I, I neither support it nor am I opposed to it. It all depends upon how one goes about doing things. And he says, I think that the philosophies of both liberalism and socialism that we have inherited from the 19th century are both a little bit too simple and too naive. And I think that, the, I mean, that's, that's, my, that's my sense of it as well. I mean, the sort of situation that we have in, the, in this country um, where you have it so polarized that people can't talk with each other, you just assume that if somebody's on the other side of the political fence, they're either immoral or, or stupid. Um, it's a bad situation, and it's, it's one that I think that we should try to, um, we should all try to do something about. Are we going to take a break? Would you like a break? Um, Pe people can wander in and out and bring uh, coffee, but if I, I, I sense that uh, maybe a fine I mean, if, if anyone needs be... to break, I don't, so... It, but if anyone needs to, five minutes. Five, five minutes, and uh, the, the bathrooms are kind of clean across from the entryway into the. W one thing that I do want to say be before we take five minutes is because I see my friend Rod Thomas is um, is uh, on the WebEx because um, somebody said yeah. uh, I just wanted to you say want to demute it so, so he can uh, offer a comment or. No, I want to talk about him. Oh. <laughs> I just want to say that um, I started writing this book um, probably back in 2000 and uh, then had to put it aside for and my wife died and I had to uh, raise my child for a, a long period of time. And it was uh, really um, Rod Thomas uh, who uh, encouraged me very strongly to go back to writing the book. Um, at that point, it was about two-thirds done, and I needed to supply a chapter on democracy. Um, but um, Rod was working on Hayek, and uh, I said, well, I have some stuff on Hayek, and I sent it to him. And, uh, and, and so, Rod, I want to thank you so much for, for insisting upon that. <laughs>